So please interject at any point. Uh, so last time, so <laughs> which is uh, you know, sort of a pretend last time. So last time, um, we looked at a few things. So cascading style sheets, uh, if only because it's an example of another style sheet language. But it's quite different, for those of you familiar. Contrast in just a sentence or so CSS versus XSLT, even though these are apparently both style sheet languages. Absolutely. So CSS itself is not an XML derivative. Sure. What else? Right. It's not a programming language. Like XSLT is a functional programming language. You can implement most anything with it, even if it might, in fact, be quite verbose. CSS is really a stylization um, language. It is used for controlling the behavior, the aesthetics of XHTML and HTML and such. But it's hard to push it beyond those limits. Whereas XSLT, you can implement logic. You can't really do that with CSS by any means. Um, XPath. So what's XPath in general all about? We certainly just talked about it. So just sum it up in a sentence. Mm -hmm. OK, so it, it allows you to query by way of these so-called location paths, very similar in spirit to paths on a hard drive, an XML document. And it's wonderful, I think, in that it's very intuitive and it follows the inherent structure of an XML document. Later in the term, we'll look briefly at um, a follow-up, if you will, to XPath known as XQuery, which is much more SQL-like, it's really a programming language unto itself and as such much more powerful, but it too borrows the same idea of using paths to actually access data. And in that sense, it's very also, I think, accessible. Um, so yeah. Uh, XML query language, that it, mm -hmm. it, XML, I'm sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> Uh, X, I mean, at the end of the day, it's largely semantics. XQuery stands for XML query. Um, but they're both used as query languages. But XQuery is far more expressive. And in fact, it's a subset of XQuery is XPath 2.0, which is the newer version. So a word actually on these version numbers, just in case the guy last week didn't emphasize this. Um, I think I actually promised as much two weeks ago. We focus, uh, I've intentionally focused most of the course's examples in the project still on XSLT 1.0 and XPath 1.0, uh, not because they're superior to 2.0. Undoubtedly, there are some newer useful features in 2.0. The support's not quite there, for instance. And if you look, for instance, to Apache as really the sort of de facto standard for the XSLT implementation, at least in the Java world, because that's what's with the JDK, it, um, it It'd be an unfortunate thing, I think, if we taught you to trust certain features that are going to be there on various platforms when they won't necessarily be there. Saxon, though, Michael Kay, the guy who wrote that one red book that I've pushed a few times as a useful reference, um, he has a full-fledged implementation of XSLT2 and XPath 2.0 in the form of Saxon, which we do have linked on the software page. You can certainly download the jars and such, integrate it into your projects, but just realize you don't get it out of the box, say, as you do with the JDK. So realize that, and over time, um, we can certainly point out various differences. Um, XSLT2 and XPath2 really solve some missing features, so solve some problems that were with XSLT1. Um, but for, certainly for your final projects, you're welcome to use Saxon and actually go beyond the scope of, say, some of the stuff we do in projects. So what about XSLT itself? What's it good for? <laughs> OK, so mixing HTML and XPath. So sure, that, that's certainly valid. But more generally, what is it? What does it do? XML. Yeah, it's a language for transforming XML into something else. It can be other XML, aka XHTML. It can be pure text. It can be most anything you want. Um, most, In fact, it is a wonderfully useful language whenever you have XML data to deal with in that it allows you to render it fairly um, I think also in a fairly straightforward fashion. Verbose, yes, but um, it's certainly a nicer language than just using, say, some of the DOM APIs that we'll see, um, that we've seen, and also we'll see again when we come to Ajax in the course. Navigating a, a DOM and walking through in sort of a linked list tree fashion is just not nearly as elegant as, say, something like XPath with XSLT, just because they're designed around the idea of XML's hierarchy. But yeah, that's certainly open for debate um, among programmers. Finally, tracks. 
another funky acronym that itself is meaningless, but what does it generally describe? So this was a subset of the JAXP API that just relates to stuff, XSLT stuff. So it's the transformation API for XML. So that, again, is a subset of JAXP, which is the Java API for XML processing, which is everything XML related. So it's just a set of classes and, um, uh, and the packages that relate to XSLT specifically within the latest JDKs. OK, and project two. So a word on project two, perhaps. Um, I, as I think I did say two weeks ago, I love this project, if only because it comes with really pretty maps and uh, is actually based on real world geography. Do take note and do take advantage of as you dive into project two's uh, X2 part, the PDFs that we have not only in the distribution but also linked here. For instance, you will see as you start rendering your HTML, and this perhaps looks overwhelming, but fortunately it's searchable with Control F. You can use these maps as sanity checks as to whether or not your own code is correct and you're actually presenting in HTML or in a couple of weeks SVG form um, the kind of data included in these files. And the file itself, xtube.xml, has almost all of this data. For the most part, it has everything within zones one through six, if you're familiar with London's layout. Um, certainly, if there's stuff omitted in the data set, you need not worry about it. But for the most part, the maps are consistent with what we've given you. And here's another one, which is essentially the tube map. So quite literally, by the end of a couple weeks from now, you'll implement your own map using SVG, this graphical language written in XML. It won't look at all like this, because a very smart and artistic guy many years ago laid out London's map in a way that's uh, nicely human readable, but not geographically consistent. So yours will be much more of a mess, but geographically consistent, thanks to our coordinates. So that's the teaser. And we'll focus today a bit on some of the My Blockbuster data set, because it's a little more accessible. All right, um, so XPath, specifically last time, just to get the, the ball rolling here. So a location path is what? Yeah, so it's just the path that you go down to get some piece of data out of your XML document. This was the thing that we formalized with steps and axes and predicates, that sort of canonical definition we had in last week's slides. And it's just the, it's just the jargon applied to what you've started using, presumably, for project two, or at least saw last week in some examples. So XPath and XSLT do have the notion of data types. Uh, Boolean values and integral values and string values, but for the most part it's not a terribly strongly typed language where there's a lot of automatic conversions between the two, um, which is pretty consistent with the spirit of XML, which is at the end of the day just one huge string anyway. So, But it is defined. There are also functions, some of which you've seen, some of which you should seek out on your own via one of the online references or Michael Kay's books or just infer from some of the lecture examples. There is also, as we'll see today, the ability to write extension functions for XSLT. This is actually a wonderful feature. There was a project I worked on a few years ago where for this building, we had a bunch of wireless um, moats, as they're called, sensor network devices, these cheap little computer devices that have very um, small uh, electronics on them and among them a wireless radio and so there were dozens of these things throughout the computer science building and they were constantly communicating with one another and we wanted to present a visualization of the relative signal strengths between each of these hops so what we were getting off of these devices because they were networked wirelessly with a central point ultimately we were getting signal readings and what we did to visualize this data was um, essentially converted to some XML format. And then I whipped up an XSLT style sheet that itself outputted SVG, which is what we'll look at in a week. And that just was used to generate either green lines for really strong connections between nodes, or red lines if it was pretty weak connections. But we ended up needing to use trigonometry, believe it or not. So even I had to refresh myself on sine and cosine and all this stuff, because we wanted to make sure that if you had, but we had readings in both directions. And if you don't want your lines to be perfectly overlapping, it's sort of non-trivial to adjust uh, the width of uh, the distance between your lines given an arbitrary rotation. So long story short, we needed some trig functions, which fortunately exist within Zalin. So Zalin, which again is the XSLT processor that Apache distributes and is 
perhaps the de facto standard around these days, um, has extension functions, which is n are not necessarily in the XSLT spec, but someone else implemented. And so long as you're using that person's processor, you can access them by using a certain namespace, namely the extension namespace. Depends on the usage varies by processor, but um, we'll point you at a reference today at which you can find other functions. And the beautiful thing about extension functions, even though it's not really consistent with the spirit of XSLT, is that you yourselves can implement any function in Java and then actually call it from within your XSLT and pass to your Java function effectively a linked list of nodes, aka a node set, and get back some return value. And that's a powerful thing, especially if you really want to push the limits with what's possible today and with what, you, what problems you actually need to solve. So do realize that, especially come final project time. So in XSLT, which is rather linked to XPath's defi uh, uh, definition, even though they are separate recommendations, there's this notion of nodes but that spirit is really borrowed from DOM. So you recall attribute nodes and comment nodes. It's all the same for the most part in XSLT2. Um, elements, any of the things we've seen thus far that start with XSL colon is an XSLT element. It's like an instruction. Uh, and then templates. What's a template with respect to XSLT? We'll see more of those today. Yeah, be careful with the style applied to a set of nodes. They're more similar in spirit to. It's almost like a, a method or something. Yeah, that's perhaps the better way to think about it. They're more like functions or methods that get applied to zero or more inputs in the <laughs> form of node sets. Um, they are the means by which you implement um, functional programming in the in the programming sense. So we'll see more of that today as we continue our look at XSLT. So just to put on, just to put in front of you, even though at the end of the day it's not terribly important usually to distinguish among these data types, these are the data types that XSLT1 supports. The one worth noting now, because it is a nuisance sometimes, is this one called an RTF, a result tree fragment, which we'll get we'll look at briefly tonight, just because it's kind of a pain that they fixed in XSLT2. But the rest are pretty straightforward. Node set is perhaps the most common one that you're going to deal with. When I was executing these demo queries a moment ago in Stylus, I was getting back node sets or lists of zero or more nodes of some sort. OK, so we mentioned conditions. And I don't think last time we looked at excuse me, conditions, um, in, at least in great detail. But they do exist within XSLT. So if you are writing a template function, a template, and you need to do something optionally, there does indeed exist the XSL if element. Unfortunately, there's no else element, which is sort of a, an unfortunate syntactical detail. And I apologize if I slow down occasionally to rest my jaw. Um, but there is the XSL choose element, which is the analog to what we all know as the if, else if, else if, else if, else construct. They chose, for whatever reason, to call it XSL choose. And it has a zero or more, or one or more when constructs and zero or one otherwise constructs, which is the equivalent of the else. Stupid. I'm sure there was some reason for it. So I certainly can't judge here at this late <laughs> date. Um, but just know that this is what we have to live with. This does work, but you can only have one of these or multiple stacked again and again. But they're not exclusively or together, as would be something like when. So when is quite literally the if, else if, else if, else if, else construct. So bear that in mind. They are, top to bottom. Top. I don't believe you can. It has to be the very last one. So the processor, I believe, would throw an error if it's all two. So again, this is if, else, 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 if, else. So as soon as the first one is, if you go into that branch, then it won't do any of the other Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Oh, to, to repeat for the camera, it is exclusive. So when the first one matches, that's it for the, uh, the block. Absolutely. So you can nest these things. You could put ifs within the whens, if that does indeed make sense. Um, more likely appropriate, though, would be to and conditions together. So you can put where I have these ellipses, rather than just saying when test is, um, for instance, when test count of the node set equals, equal, or equals 2. If you also wanted to say if the node set is of size 2 or 3, you could quite literally say 
um, count, and let's pretend that the node set is called n in question. So count equals 3, literally writing or count, oops, count of n equals 4. So you wouldn't necessarily need to nest an if in there, perhaps, um, but you could certainly and them or or them together in this way. Other questions? Yeah, okay. Um, iteration. So we certainly saw this idea of iterating, and this is a wonderfully um, useful construct. And I would say, as I think I said in last week's video, that there are sort of different mental models that you can adopt for yourself when approaching XSLT, uh, that of a push model or that of a pull model. I, a true believer in XSLT was very much a proponent of the so-called um, push model, where you write templates. And by way of the built-in templates, which we did look at briefly last week and we'll come back to today, everything sort of just works sort of automagically because of the recursion that is inherently built into XSLT. I have typically felt that for um, neophytes when it comes to XSLT, that it's much simpler to view XSLT and get acclimated to its syntax by taking more of a pull <laughs> approach, where you write a, main, a template that matches on the root node <laughs> slash the document node or rather the root element, and then you pull the data out that you're interested in, typically by way of one of these for each statements. Um, again, both approaches possible, uh, but I think it's easier to get comfortable with XSLT via this approach. But the more savvy you get, and we'll see a couple of examples tonight, the neater things that you can do with XSLT once you really understand how the processor works. So that's why we'll emphasize these built-in templates in a bit. There is this ability to sort with iterative code. Uh, the catch is that if you're going to sort the node set that's being iterated over, you've got to do it as the first child of the sort element. So there are sometimes these gotchas where you have to know where it's valid to put these elements. That'll make more sense in the future when we look at XML schema and, you, and you're an introduced to a means of expressing these kinds of constraints. Yeah? So let's say naively it seems that uh, sorting would be better as an attribute. Well, I mean, it seems to change this, either modifier on the semantics of the for each. Yeah. Uh, so. It is um, a modifier on the for each construct. And let me just pull up one thing here and see if I can make a stronger point than one I can make verbally. Fortunately, Stylus is one of these annoying programs that thinks you care what's going on all the time. So a uh, select XSL sort. So I suspect, but again, here you would have to have been at the uh, working group table. Because there's a lot of options that are possible with sort, um, I suspect that it quickly becomes messy and you lose the ability to have extensibility. So I suspect that's why they made that judgment call. But I certainly agree that it would be nice if it were more compactly defined, but such is the way it is. And actually, if I didn't make this point last week, Perhaps the best reason to start using, if you have a PC at least, either XML Spy or Stylus, is because of the um, auto-completion features that they have. They're honestly wonderfully uh, useful pedagogical tools because you're not constantly looking things up. You have a list for pushed at you as to what's possible with a given element. It's wonderfully useful. And even though there's this slight delay, poke around the preferences menu and these things can be tweaked so that they pop up immediately to save you even more milliseconds while coding things up. OK, so patterns and templates. So now we'll try to refine exactly what it is that's going on when we apply a style sheet to an XML document. So the typical approach that one takes to using these templates is to, one, at bottom, define a template that matches on a certain type of node. We've seen in last week's examples matching just on the root element with forward slash, or I think we saw a couple of examples where it matched on specifically named elements. If you know what you want the title element, how you want the title element in some document to be processed, you can create a template for it. But the only way that that template's going to get applied to anything is if, by way of a sequence of recursive steps typically, apply templates actually gets called on the node in question. 
And we'll see what that means in just a second. Um, a word on this, which I won't dwell on because it's likely not terribly useful, at least for our purposes, but know that it exists. You can have multiple modes associated with a template. There's not really an analog. There's not really a perfect analog in the world of programming that most of us are familiar with. But suffice it to say that if you want to have identically named templates or identically, or rather, templates that match on the same nodes, but certain ones are invoked based on the mode that you're r running your processor, you can essentially say if you have a template that matches on the root element like this, and you have another template that also matches on the root element, well, there's going to be a priority typically, so that only one template's going to get applied to your document. But the idea of mode, for instance, allows you to do this. If you want to implement two different templates, both of which match on the same nodes, one called production mode, one called development mode, you can essentially have one of those templates defined to just print out, say, a lot of auxiliary information that's just useful for debugging purposes. Whereas production mode does the same logic, but without all the debugging information. The idea being that you can select at runtime which of your templates is actually going to get applied. And you do that by specifying the mode. And so in fact, in Stylus, for instance, when you actually apply a style sheet to an XML document, you can, if I can recall, uh, I'd have to take a look closely where they have it now. You can essentially specify, or rather, you can specify in the document itself with what mode you want to invoke. The application. I'll poke around later as to exactly how to specify it. Yep. It cannot be a relevant question, but uh, <clears throat> so can you apply more than one template to a particular node name or node type? So one deals with color, one deals with font size, for example. Good question. So can you apply multiple templates to the same node? Um, Short answer is it depends. If you use automatic matching by calling apply templates, which I'll try to make more concrete in a moment with some examples, no, there's a priority to the templates. And the template with the highest priority is the only one that's going to get applied. However, you can manually essentially specify that some template should be called on a certain set of nodes. And you do that by way of call template as opposed to apply templates. So apply templates, you really leave your fate in the processor's hands to figure out what should get applied to what. With call template, you can exercise more manual control. And with apply templates, though, in automatic application of templates, there's a built-in priority scheme, which I'm pretty sure we did look at last week, some slide where there's a little box down here that gave you some sample priorities. Uh, let me take a look at one of our examples and see when best to integrate. Uh, examples 5. Uh, titles. Take a quick peek here. Uh, that's pretty easy compared to last week. Titles mm -hmm. 2. Okay, so let, let's take a look at this actually so that we actually can put some of this conversation in context. So I'm going to open up our example, which you should have printouts of, uh, called Titles 2. This is in our Examples 5 directory. And there are granted some comments there. Just tell me if the font's a little too small. But again, you do have a printout. Um, clearly, the comments say what's going on here. But how is it working? If, you could, if someone could expound with a couple sentences on what's going on here. And I'll, I'll prod us along. What's the first thing that happens when I apply this template to my blockbuster.xml? OK, so this blinking line here defines a template that apparently matches on the root node. There's no other. So this is indeed the guy that's going to get matched on. The idea being, when you apply a template to an XML document, it literally starts from the top on down. So nothing's going to happen if nothing matches on the root node. Now, that's a bit of a white lie, because there are those built-in templates, which we'll see a reminder of in a moment, I think, if we didn't already. Um, that ensure that something's going to happen. But if you override them, for instance, and don't do anything recursively, then you will short circuit the whole process. But here we clearly do, at the blinking line, have a template that's going to match the root of the document. What does it proceed to do in the next few lines? Yeah, so it creates a variable called, um, 
what we got called movies here. And I do that simply with this. And this is, um, in this case, arguably not necessary, but useful for clarity and for efficiency sake. Could be useful, as in our discussion when we were writing on the board over here, just so that you're not re-executing the same path multiple times. What am I doing with that variable? Uh, not just a node necessarily. A bunch of nodes, a, node, a list of nodes. Good. Uh, that are going to be uh, uh, movie uh, uh, siblings. Okay, sure. Um, yep, sure. Yeah, movie, movie siblings. Sure. And uh, so that it's it, it's going to it's going to be an object that contains a list of nodes. Good, and I, let me tweak some of the verbiage you use. So this query here, this location path here, is going to give us back a node set. Uh, whose members are all movie elements that do happen to be siblings because we know what the document looks like, presumably, if you recall. All right, and what are we doing with that variable? Yeah? I'll say of the session going to be siblings because the, the path or the locator or whatever you use says they are. Indeed. So, right. So, it's also implied by the location path, but it should be even more clear if you're familiar with the document. Sure. And what are we doing with this node set? Okay. Pass it the node set. Perfect. So we're gonna in, we're gonna call this uh, template called explicitly called print titles with a parameter called nodes, and we're gonna give that parameter the value of um, movie. So this would be the sort of manual approach to invoking a template on a set of nodes. So down here we actually have that template. So it looks like it's defined as taking a parameter called nodes. Okay. So that's to be expected based on how we called it. Now it looks like we're calling XSL value of this. So what does this do? Physically, and I used br tags even though I cut corners and didn't bother outputting the rest of the HTML. This locates. Is, is this zero? <laughs> I, I want to say the first node, but it, I, it wouldn't be the first node if it's zero relative. It's either actually the second. Node. It is, but where do we start counting for node sets? Um, in the top of the document. So, uh, in, with regard to a node set, though, this is in fact the first element, okay. so it's not in zero indexed. Who know There too. Wish I knew the history. <laughs> okay. So, so in real terms, though, what does this do? This one line here prints out what? Perfect. Prints out the title of the first movie in that node set. To be clear, to be precise. All right. We're printing out a line break, and then what's this doing? Well, here's another. <laughs> no, I don't mean to sound critical, because I actually am a fan of this stuff. But there are definitely some stupid syntactical things. I think. So this is one escaped as a, an ampersand GT because you can't have certain characters in your document, lest you confuse this thing, or at least less than you cannot have. Um, what's this doing? So if the number of nodes is greater than one, that means there's more nodes to print. So this isn't necessarily the only, this is not the only way to do this, but as the name of this template implies and this example implies, the whole purpose of this style sheet is to print the titles of the movies, but to do it recursively. Not because it's the best way necessarily, or the only way, but because it is a way. And it does demonstrate the tail recursive nature of at least how you can implement some templates. So we're calling a template called print titles, or self recall. That's where we are. So here's a recursive call, calling it with the same parameter name. But this time, what are we doing effectively with this syntax here? We're moving it up to the next node, next Exactly. So those of you familiar with, say, Lisp or Scheme, we're taking the cutter essentially of the linked list here, and we of the node set here, and we're we're calling ourselves with all but the first elements of the list. So if you recurse mentally now, it's going to pass in a list of this size, then this size, this size, this size, this size, and eventually we're going to pass in the empty list. At which point, the base case ensures that we bottom out and we return at that point. Sure. Sure. So here we have a variable name, or rather an, or a parameter name, so called node. So that's a node set. Bracket implies that this is a what in expat speak? Sorry? It, it is in effect indexing, but not because it's an array or anything like that. So this is a so-called predicate. So this is a filter, essentially, on the nodes that we want to select. Specifically, we want to select all those nodes for whom the position function returns a value that's greater than 1. Because the nodes themselves are numbered from 1, 2, 3 on upward, 
The effect of this is to select all of the nodes that were passed in originally, but then to filter and in ultimately include only those nodes whose position is greater than one. So that is the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so forth nodes, if any remain. So that's a way, again, of truncating, chopping off, popping off the front of the list. Yeah? So instead of modifying the node set in place, we basically give it back to the template, but with a filter saying, work on just this subpart. Exactly. So it, it's a functional programming language in the true sense. There are no side effects. You can't change the value of this variable. You can't just throw away the first element, but you can pass a subset of that elements um, of that node sets uh, elements to another template. Yeah. Can you explain why you're using variable instead of parameter? Variable instead of oh, so when I just verbally. Oh, up here. Yeah. Um, so there's arguably no reason for this. I could have just pasted everything between quotes here and put it right here. So I mean, why are you using SSL colon variable? So OK, because this is a variable in the I am declaring a variable sense. I, just for my convenience, want to be able to refer to those nodes as the dollar sign movies variable. It's not a parameter because this template was not passed in any arguments. Right? It was just applied to the root element of the tree. Okay. Here, though, this is a template that explicitly takes a parameter that I happen to call nodes. Um, but if it, again, to be clear, there's no need for this. It's just a piece of sugar to um, give us another conversation point. And, and that variable Correct. So variables are scoped only to where you would presumably expect them to live, which is between uh, within the element that they were defined. Exactly. Unless they are a global variable, so to speak, defined at the very top of the style sheet, which is useful when you want constants, essentially. Is that a. Yeah. But you have multiple parameters for some Multiple. Say again? Can you have multiple parameters? Absolutely. Just list them as siblings, one after the other, but at the very top of the template. Yep, absolutely. Other questions? Yep. So I think they define that the, the whole top of the uh, quiz is predicate in, the, in terms of which is greater than one. Mm -hmm. It's only way of doing it. In essence, I cannot tolerate and know that I always have a create a variable to remain and pass that in. You could do this. So let's see. So what I think you're saying is in here, I might want to do XSL variab variable and name equals, we'll call it foo, and then select. And then here, I do want to select nodes. Position uh, is greater than 1. And again, greater than is OK. Um, and then here, what would I want to pass if I continue where I'm going with this? So that would work, but it doesn't really gain you anything. Right? Again, it's sort of the same argument up here. This didn't really save me any time. Maybe it made things slightly more clear. It kept the line shorter, but nothing real. But there's no other notation to say, let's say, two dot dot, I don't know, something. I'm not sure I follow, two dot dot. Oh, sure. Uh, so short answer, no. This is the notation you're, you're dealt. Yeah. You could do this one other way, right? You could, and this would just be for the intellectual exercise, you could certainly chop off the last element. So if I wanted just for some reason to reverse the list of the titles, I could, for instance, say um, posit, or rather, no, it's not going to autocomplete. So last would give me the last element there. And then what would I want to do here? So the same other side of the coin, but function out, functionally it's almost the same, except we get a reverse list now. Unless, if you want to really play around, unless we then put this after the recursive call, then that too would go back to the original layout. OK, but enough playing with mine. OK, other questions? 
OK. Um, so let me say a word on this. Even though mode is interjected here, I don't want to dwell on mode just because it's, it is of, uh, at least in week two of this stuff, of limited utility. But let me remind us of the fact that there are these built-in templates. Because really, this slide and its counterpart last week and these three templates really explain all of XSLT. Right? All of the rest is just the implementation details. So when you apply an XSLT style sheet to an XML document, the processor starts at the root element of the XML document and tries to match templates from the top on down. If you have no templates defined, but instead your style sheet looks quite simply like that, is that a valid style sheet? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so syntactically, syntactically it's valid. I'm going to click this dot 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 button and associate this with my blockbuster.xml just so that we have some XML to play around with. Uh, my blockbuster.xml. Now I'm going to go ahead and execute the style sheet, which again, Stylus uses this little play icon. It wants me to save it, and that's fine. <laughs> okay, so now notice this craziness. And this is why, again, these programs are wonderfully useful because they render the output and you don't have to deal with the command line. So there's different modes here. Right now I'm in the IE mode. Let's just take a look at the text mode so that we can really see what got spit out. And what does it look like happened? Mm -hmm. So clearly all of the text nodes got printed out but what got stripped was all of the actual elements and the attributes. But the stuff, heck, is even indented the same way as the original document was. We've just lost all of the metadata. So why is that? Well, here's my style sheet at top left. There's no templates. So when you apply this style sheet to my blockbuster.xml, what gets matched with what at step one? Right, the built-in template. So that's where the, the magic, so to speak, happens. So one of the built-in templates that we have, one of the built-in templates that we have is this first one. And you can ignore for today's discussion mode, since again, it just adds an, another detail. The default template that matches is that one that says template match either star or slash. Okay, so what that's effectively saying is that this is the default template for the root element or what else? Any other element, in fact. What then is the next line implying should happen to that root element and or any element to which that template's applied? Go apply one of the other templates to it. Go apply one of the other <laughs> templates to not it, but to whom? <clears throat> it's children, right? And I think this was a subtle point that last week's lecture mentioned. Whoops which is that what's default, the default here, and again, for simplicity, I'll just remove mode altogether for this discussion. The default value for select for apply templates, and this would be in the documentation, is child colon colon star, which is equivalent to just saying star. Remember, that's the shorthand notation. So what that essentially means is match on the root element, and then look at all of your children, and then call apply whatever template's appropriate to each of your children in turn. In my blockbuster, the child of the root element is the database element. So in turn, he has which children? Um, actors, actors and movies. So those two, those are children. So the recursion repeats, presumably, right? Because he gets called on, his, he calls apply templates on his children. Each of those children, movies and actors, are themselves elements. Which template matches? Well, it turns out the same one. Those guys, in turn, have a whole bunch of elements uh, as children, the movie elements and the actor elements. So all of those nodes get, uh, um, have the default templates applied to them. When you finally reach, for instance, the actor element, what kind of children does an actor element have? A text node. So it is a child, so that apply templates, select star, will apply to any zero or more text nodes for each of those actor elements. But once apply templates is called on a text node, which of the default templates is relevant? Yeah, the second one, which says if you're a text node or an attribute, what should you do? Yeah, so it or really the processor should print out the value of that node. Ergo, 
we get a dump of all the text in the file, but none of the metadata. So what if I wanted to short circuit this, just to make clear the process that's going on? Suppose that I wanted to only print, let's just get a little crazy here, the first letter of every text node, just because. How do I do this? OK. <laughs> Good, XSL template. OK, maxed on that node test, sure. Autocomplete's also a wonderful feature of these things. OK, so XSL value of. I mean, it, it really, it's like being told exactly how to do your homework here, right? So the, the string we want to do is what here? Dot. Dot, which is the same thing as, just to be clear, self node, right? Which is a pain to type, so better to just say dot, followed by one. OK, close the element so that it's an empty element. Go ahead and save it, run it, fingers crossed. Nicely done. Got rid of all that white space and also just kept the first character. That's pretty cool. So completely arbitrary example, but hopefully illustrates mentally exactly what we've just done, which specifically is to override this second built-in template with our own. So recall briefly last week's discussion of priorities. The built-in templates have lower priority than anything you write for this reason, so that you can override them by just matching on the same type of nodes. And just to be clear further, let's do one other thing to reinforce this. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff. Suppose that what I want to do now is um, say, pretend we're in the context of HTML, and I just want to make sure that all of the titles of movies print out in bold. And I don't really care for now what happens to anything else in the file. How do I do that? Ensure that titles, when they get processed, they get spit out with open bold, close bold tags, flanking them. OK, so we got uh, XSL template. Whoops. Uh, well, we can go try either. Start with this one. So match equals. Title, what do you want to do? Uh, Good, V. Good, so value of select. Good. OK, so to be clear, we seem to have defined a template that matches title, which is going to override what? The first one, but only for elements obviously called title. For the other elements in the document, built-in template's going to kick in. So let's process this. And now, we even have a nice highlighting here. This jumps out at you. So everything else is just dumped as usual. But Carmen, which is the name of one of the movies, the, the last movie in the file, is in boldface. Yeah? Could you go over a little bit what the difference is between um, apply template and call template? Sure. This, this is a good segue to go over the difference between apply templates and just and template. So template, as we've, you just used it in these two examples, defines the behavior for, defines what should happen for a given template, or for a given element, rather. Or though you can generalize it to other types of nodes, but elements are the most common. So apply templates allows us to invoke, or rather allows us to forcibly have applied all templates appropriate to a certain set of nodes. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, notice the implications of taking this um, push approach, so to speak, with XSLT. If I only want to print out the titles of movies in this document, I got a lot of work ahead of myself because there's a whole bunch of other elements, right? If I don't want rating like PG to show up anymore, well, all right, let's do this. So I'm going to define another template. Whoops, I'm going to define another template. Uh, this one's going to match on rating. But I really don't want anything to happen to rating. So essentially, I'm going to override the built-in template that currently is dumping its text value. And I'm going to say, forget it. Don't do anything. I'm going to run this. And now notice that our output is the 
same. Program scrolled a little bit differently, but notice that missing from Carmen's output is the rating. But I still got a heck of a lot of work ahead of me. So this is clearly not a nice approach. So how can I fix this? If really what I want is only a movie's, every movie's title in bold, and I don't want any of this other junk. How do I avoid all this junk printing without, oh my god, copying, pasting the thing and making template after template after template? So we could absolutely match it at the root and really short circuit the process. But perhaps just for argument's sake, let's try to tackle the problem just one level higher. Right? All of these things that are printing are children of what? Uh, not text notes. Who's the parent of each of these nodes, line by line? A movie, right? So this, for instance, is the title of a movie. This is, I think, an actor ref of a movie. Uh, this is the uh, image of a movie, the rating of a movie. So it was all children. So recall that our document looked like this. Sure. So the actors are all up at the top. Oh, of the output. Uh, They're still up there, too. We've just been focusing on the movies. OK, so what if, though, if the problem, at least one of the problems here, is that there's so many elements associated with the movie, and they're just all getting dumped out by default because of that built-in template, why don't I just try to head them off at the pass and go up one level and nip this thing in the bud at the level of the movie elements and specify override the default behavior for the whole darn movie element who has all these children? Well, what I can do is, in my style sheet, Let's go back to just this one template. Let's instead say match on the movie element. And now, just for kicks, I'm going to very explicitly do this for the movie element. The only thing I want to do for each movie element is print the XSL value of select my child called title. OK, and I'm, whoops. I'm going to go ahead and boldface this just to be consistent with our story. OK. So now I've overridden the behavior of movie, which, because of that recursive process, will get invoked before any title elements would get matched. So if I run this now, what am I going to see? Good. So all the actors still, because I haven't touched them, but only the titles of movies, hopefully. And indeed, I do. So again, I've sort of gone one step higher in the tree and preempted the application of templates to all those other nodes. But why? And here in comes the, the discussion of apply templates. So previously, what template matched the element called movie? That default one, right? The built-in one, which again looks like this. And what did this guy do, to be clear? Sorry? Right, or rather, he applied templates to all of his children. Therein laid the recursion. Am I doing that here? I am not calling apply templates, which means once the processor reaches a movie element, it does indeed print out the title, but the so-called buck stops there. There's no more recursion. We are at a leaf node in our processing. If, however, I wanted to continue along the lines of this push approach that I've had, maybe better is not to just pull the value of my child. Right? Let's just wait until the processor gets to my child to print that value. In other words, what if I instead do this? XSL, apply, whoops, XSL, apply templates to whom? Where am I going with this? Yeah, so let's just call it, and just to be explicit, my title children. Okay, so I'm going to apply templates. Now, unfortunately, if I run this thing now and ignore the annoying error message there, <laughs> couldn't possibly be more clear that I made a mistake. Um, so notice now I'm explicitly calling apply templates on my children. What template is going to match my child called title? Text note? Uh, not text note, because a title is an oh. element. So we're back to the default story. So watch what happens now. Let's run this thing. We get all the titles, but no bold facing. So we haven't quite solved our problem. But now I can go ahead and implement a template that matches on my title node. 
And here, I can go back to the way things were just a few moments ago, where here I was doing XSL, value of, select, myself, and then, to finish our goal, bold facing. Run this, and now we're back to where we were. So in the span of a five minutes or so, we've seen half a dozen different ways of approaching this. But hopefully what's most important, even if it's not wholly clear just yet, at why the processor is behaving in these different ways and how, what the relationship is between my manually defined templates and these built-in templates. For tape's sake, let's go ahead and take our break here, but I'll field questions one-on-one. -on -one. OK, uh, your hand first. OK, so we're back. You want to rephrase your question? Sure. So Uh -huh. And apply it on the title mm -hmm. element. And then there is another template definition which matches on title and which prints a value of itself. Okay. So, we, so only one of them is getting applied, right? Uh, be more precise. The second one gets applied. Okay. And the first one. Is Both get applied. But who? create a situation, the situation in which that template gets applied to movie elements. Who applied it? Good. The built-in template is the guy. The parent of movie, which is the movie's element, was handled by the built-in template. And that built-in template's sole purpose in life is to call apply templates on all of his children. Exactly. So both of these templates, in our example, are indeed invoked, but by different calls to apply templates, because they're at different levels in the tree. We could have removed the first template definition altogether and do the work with the template. No. So that would have reverted us back to our previous situation. If I remove this, I'm overriding the default behavior, or rather, I'm overriding the template that handles the title element, but what did you just do? Right, exactly. Now I get all the junk from the file again, because now all of the siblings of title are handled by the built-in template, which just says spit them out, which was not the point. So just to be clear, the alternative to this approach in today's lecture versus last week's lecture is meant to be, dare say, more sophisticated, or at least in the types of ideas we're putting forward. So if you were com more comfortable last week, by all means, continue to play mentally in that world of using for each more and pulling data more out of the document rather than sort of crossing your fingers and hoping you've implemented the right templates. But it's when you get, I think, to the mental level of sophistication of being quite comfortable with this that XSLT really gets kind of cool as to how it all starts to work. Oh, uh, it's here in the. Yep. Is it possible to find a template that matches all elements that don't have a certain name? Ah, um, that's a good question. Can you define a template that matches all nodes that are not of a certain name? Um, Let's, let me think aloud, and I might fumble with some syntax here for a moment. So if I say not, That's a good example. So just to repeat for the camera, um, suppose that you had a bunch of nodes that have some common prefix, like private underscore, and you just want, by convention, those nodes not to get printed out for some reason. It'd be nice to be able to find a template that, quite specifically, does not print those. So let me hit execute here and just see if I can do this off the top of my head, because these are fun questions. Uh, Pinocchio. So that did not. Uh, actually, would that be based on this um, You could, but you, if you end up going with choose, then you kind of you have to know a priori what all the elements' names are, and you'd have to hard code them in. So what I'm trying to get here is a more generalized solution where you only and you exclude explicitly those with say a certain prefix, or in my simpler example, your ones of a certain name. Oops. Oh. Uh, Oh, thank you. Out of order. 
No, still printing the titles. Um, let me just think for a second here. Not equal, because there's no notion of assignment. Um, so the single equal suffices. Let me think about that um, and as to why this is not working as well. Because that's, that's a neat question. And if I don't think of it by tonight, I'll try to remember to send it over to the listserv and just email me if I forget. It's a good question. Yeah? Performance-wise, is there a difference between pushing and pulling? Because you're asking, uh, I don't know, are you in MATLAB or R? That's going to throw It's definitely going to be used for iteration. Mm -hmm. So good questions. So the performance implications of push versus pull. I think it really it ultimately depends on the processor. I would say though, if you use this push approach, um, I mean in spirit, in theory, given the examples we've been using, it's far less efficient because you're touching every node in the document because you're letting all of this recursion go on. In co by contrast, if you instead define one template that matches the root element and then you proactively pull elements. Um, in theory, the processor could make that a more efficient process by only if it sort of has the tree modeled in such a way that it can very easily access those elements directly without essentially searching the whole tree. So I think it's tough to answer in the abstract except to say that you should certainly try to avoid touching nodes unnecessarily. So the approach that we took and a moment ago when I short circuited that whole recursive process by matching on movie as opposed to the individual title element, that certainly was an improvement because we truncated a huge number of branches from the, uh, the call tree that would have gotten um, created in memory. So I would say it depends. I think you can write bad code either way. Okay. So we have the template defined everything between the end and the start element, which is not the command for the for the processor gate can get printed to the screen. Yes. Yeah, it would get printed well it, it what you want what gets printed is what's inside of the templates. So the only other stuff that can be up here, for instance, is special elements like XSL output and a few other things, a couple of which we looked at last week. And you'll see in the code that we've given you for Project 2, for instance, that we have a couple of configuration options as children of the root elements. But if you actually want stuff printed out, it's got to go inside the templates themselves, because that's what gets invoked. Good question. OK, so a couple of uh, features to point out so that you know they exist. There is indeed this notion of priority. And when you maybe have many more templates, at play, maybe you start having uh, multiple files, each with its own templates that maybe match the same types of elements. If you want to exercise more fine-grained control over what has which priority, you can explicitly specify the priority of a template. So just know that this feature exists, though I'll concede that I don't foresee you needing it, certainly for the class's purposes. But know that it exists. Um, includes. There is the ability to include one file within a style sheet so that you can effectively call templates or invoke templates that are in the other file. If you use XSL include, those in included templates have the same priority. So they come in at the same priority. So if there are conflicts, it's the one that's listed first in the file that's going to match. By contrast, if you want to ensure in the spirit of, for instance, using someone else's template, uh, XSL file as like a library. And we actually have, I think, under software on the website, under XSLT, I think we point you at at least one XSLT library, which has some nice helper functions, if you will. If you want to make sure that that guy's code doesn't take priority over yours, use import instead. Because no matter what the priorities are numerically, implicit or explicit, they get uh, downgraded to lower priority than any of your own stuff. So odds are that's what you would want to use when you didn't yourself write the other file. So just know that that feature exists as well. Variables, you've seen this as well. Um, in the box here, variable, values cannot be reassigned. If you're familiar with functional programming, um, that is the nature of functional programming, that you don't have side effects, you don't have assignment, so to speak. In real terms, what that means is once you define a variable in XSLT, don't try to change what it is. You can't. It won't change. So that is to say, you can't say XSL variable name equals foo, select something, then a few lines later, change what that variable is mapped to. It won't work. 
um, two ways to define a variable's value, either with select or just by putting it inside of the open tag and the close tag. Um, there's a subtle difference. Um, for now, I would say almost always you should use the first approach. If you use the second approach with XSLT1, you will run potentially into problems with the rudder called result tree fragments. So for now, uh, assume that you should try as best you can to use select. But there are certainly circumstances where the second is useful. Um, and here's where I can point out what you need to be aware of. So uh, this first example here is, the exa is an example of declaring a variable called oogle, just because I think I was running out of words at the time. Um, you would think, well, let me just pose the question. What kind of data is stored in the variable called oogle? What data type? And we've seen the list earlier tonight. And it's kind of a leading question, I know. You don't know. Um, looking at this, what would you hope is stored conceptually? OK, so it could be a string, certainly. Better yet, ideally. Sorry? OK, so C data, essentially a string, sure. But think like XML people, right? Well, you probably don't want a string when this thing inside of the variable looks like what? Well, it is text. Yeah, I mean, I view it, frankly, sort of in my mind as a bunch of elements, the root of which is a foo element. So personally, and granted it was a leading question, I'd like to think that stored in Oogle is a node set with one node, a node called, an element called foo, that just so happens to have two children, bar and quux, each of whom in turn has a child that's a text node. I mean, that's at least the mindset you should hopefully begin to get into when you view text. Like, the beauty of XML and XSLT is that you have nodes to play with, no longer strings to have to uh, parse. But in XSLT1, you get neither. It's not a string per se, and it's not a node set per se. It's an RTF, a result tree fragment, a data type that is no more in XSLT2. Um, long story short, this is not a node set, which means you cannot iterate over the value of Oogle as though it were a node set with for each know that there exists an extension function in Zalin, which I'll point you at in a bit, uh, that allows you to convert an RTF into what you would hope would be the resulting node set, namely a foo element with all of its children. So just be aware of this issue, which is why, as a simpler rule of thumb, I just urge you to try to avoid the second piece of syntax, lest you just run into issues unexpectedly. So just FYI. Uh, the latter there, same deal as parameters. As in other programming languages, a parameter slash arguments, really the same thing as a variable, a local variable, how it's handled. So you run into the same issue there as well if you define a parameter with a default value like that. OK. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of what, um, do I want to say this? So I'll put this up, but not dwell on this, only because I don't foresee you tripping over this all that much. If I were to define oogle, as I did on the previous slide, and use copy of, what I would get out is this string. If I do value of, what I would get is the concatenation of all the children there. So just FYI, though I actually don't think this is terribly useful to know. But I put it out there just for the sake of completeness. OK, so more interesting now is perhaps this idea. So. Let's take a look. Copy of. So rather than focus on this example here, what I'm going to turn our attention to is three examples. You'll recall from project one that one of your tasks was to convert all attribute nodes to, rather, all attributes to child nodes. And you did this in Java using Xerxes and the real sax and or DOM API, presumably. All right, so how can you do it in a different language? Well, here's an XSLT implementation of that same idea. And let's take a look. So this first version is a little longer, but hopefully it's a bit clear because it is this sort of pull approach. So to be clear, if I run this thing on, let's say um, uh, my blockbuster, what's an example of a node in my blockbuster that has an attribute? Uh, the movie has an ID attribute, for instance, and the actor, I think, too, had a, an ID. So if we apply this thing, 
I've got a bunch of output, lots to do. And now I'm going to go to the text mode and notice if I scroll up, notice that indeed the actor attributes have become child elements. And if I scroll down a bit, so have the movie elements, ID attributes become child elements. So we seem to have a solution to the problem, but in XSLT. Let's take a look at how we did this. So up here, the first template that matches is which? And please speak up if the font is too small. But you do have a printout as well. OK, so it's that root one. So the very first template at top matches the root of the document. Now I'm explicitly calling converter. What am I passing to converter as an argument? All the child notes, which happen to be what in this myblockbuster.xml? Database. database. Well, not everything. Just database. That's the only child by nature of the root of the document. OK, so here we are in the converter template starting here. And it takes a parameter called notes. And now I'm doing a for each. And this thing actually just looks long because I commented it pretty thoroughly. So here we're iterating. Now I'm using this new choose construct. What am I doing? So when the current node is a comment, what am I doing? And there are other ways to do this. Yeah, not even just print it out. And I am printing out the value of the comment, but what am I also outputting? Yeah, I'm outputting a comment. So using XSL comment. So recall that XSLT allows you to take XML and input and output XML. Well, how do you create new nodes in XML? Or rather, how do you create new nodes with XSLT? Well, one of the tags you can use is XSL comment. This creates in the output document a comment node, really in the DOM sense. So there's another way to do this. I could have used the copy element, but I'm just being more explicit here as to what's going on. If instead I'm a PI, what am I doing? And that's right here. If I'm a PI, what happens? Yeah, I create another PI, right? So again here, I'm sort of creating work for myself, because if I'm already got a PI, I seem to be sort of dissecting it and then creating a new one out of it. But at the end of the day, I'm just making a copy of the PI. And it's going to get spit out as well. What if instead I am a text node? This one's easy. Right, I can just print that out. And because it's text, it becomes a text node. So I don't need to do the flanking there. And then finally, there's this otherwise condition. Otherwise, what must I be? Careful. An element. I can't be an attribute at this point in the story. Why? Mm, too high up in the tree, but not quite the reason. I'm in a for each, but what am I iterating over? The database, but even more generally, what nodes am I iterating over? They were children, elements. Attributes are not children coming back to a point I think we made two weeks ago, that fundamental distinction. So even though you can find the parent of an attribute, attributes are not children of anything. So that's why the only types of nodes we could possibly be iterating over are those that themselves can be children, which really is only comments and PIs and other elements. OK, so if I'm an element, I'm going to output a new element, the same name, and this is what's called an attribute value template, which I'll define formally in a moment. Long story short, this is shorthand notation. If you want to output the value of some like function or some node, and you don't want to have to deal with XSL value of, which tends to get very verbose, and you want to do it instead inside of quotation marks, either in HTML or in this case XSL, you just enclose it with curly braces. And what you get back out is a value, much like you would if you used XSL value of somehow. OK, what am I now doing? I've started outputting an element of an identical name. And here's the magic. For each of my attributes, output an element. And because of the context, it's a child element whose name is that, whose value is the attributes value, close element. And now here's the final step. Why am I doing this? And it's also a leading question because of the comment. but. I need to recurse now. right? If I want to convert the whole document, I need to recurse on the children that this element might have. So I need to have that line there. Otherwise, the buck would have stopped with which node in this document. 
right? We're not databases as far as we would get, right? Because we'd be iterating over the database element right now, but we would never look at his children. So really, this would be an in, uh, incomplete solution. So it's kind of cool. And there's a bunch of code there. So do look it over, especially since there's a little bit of new syntax. But let's now do better than this. Because you'll see in a moment the power of XSLT, because we can whittle this problem down even further. So here's version 2. So processing, processing instruction, you don't see them that often. But it's something in a document that starts with this, and then has a name like foo, and then has some value here. Uh, and it is meant to be, it's like a comment, but for the computer, not for the human. So for now, that's probably sufficient. But we'll see it. Actually, I think we saw it. You sh I think you would have seen it in last week's video when I applied myblockbuster.xsl to myblockbuster.xml using a PI that told IE to render the XML using that style sheet. So take a look back. If you look at the example code from last week, there is built into Internet Explorer MSXML, which is Microsoft's XML engine, which understands a certain PI that if you embed it in an XML file, it will go find an XSL file to apply to it and render it. So that's the only instance that I think I'll ever show you of a PI. But just know that it, that kind of functionality is possible. Yep, exactly. So here is version 2. So version 2 now is a bit of a hybrid between the so-called push and pull approaches. So let's take a look. This guy too matches on the root. But then I begin this recursive process of calling apply templates, not explicitly, but just making this leap of faith that the processor will figure out what templates to apply to all my children, which the first time this is run, what's being passed in? Database. Good. Story is the same. Now what happens? Well, database is an element. Star matches elements by default on the child axis. So what do we do? Well, for the element, we output the name of the element. And then here's the same code as before. Iterate over the attributes. Then namespaces I added for completeness. But then I said, wait a minute, too hard. Let's not even bother. But I put it there at least this time. And then finally, apply templates, select child, colon, colon, node. So what is, well, do we have some more down here? Oh yeah, we do have more, thankfully. Notice now, again, this is more in the spirit of the push approach. Rather than iterating over and using that big old choose statement, I'm trusting in the recursive nature of my call to apply templates that these guys will just get called when appropriate. Because I'm matching not on the name of a node, but on the type of a node using these, excuse me, node tests. So perhaps tonight, especially if you're a little uncomfortable with the distinction between pull and push, maybe spend some time comparing and contrasting attribute converter 1 and attribute converter 2, because functionally they're the same, but they're implemented from a different angle, so to speak. But the purpose of this story was to get to version 3, which literally whittles that problem down from project 1 to these few lines of code. So the coolest, most sophisticated way, and maybe there's even a better, slicker way to do this, <coughs> but to, copy, to create a copy of the input document, but still changing all attributes to children elements can be done as follows. Here's a template that matches node, which this really overrides what? Kind of the first in. Definitely the built-in one for both slash and also star. What else does it override? Text, what else? Comments, Comment, everything. Right? Because node is the most general node test you can use, it actually overrides all of the built-in templates, which is why this is so arguably slick or so versatile. So what do I do? Well, it turns out there is this copy instruction. And for the particulars of it, I would refer you to Michael Kay's book or one of the online references, W3Schools, great reference for this stuff. Notice what I'm doing. For each attribute for the current node, Output an element and output a new element with the attributes value, and then call apply templates on your children. That's it. So, why does this work? Well, this call to XSL copy, it turns out, effectively creates a copy of the current node, whatever it is. If it's a comment, you get a copy of it. If it's a PI, you get a copy of it. If it's an element, you get a copy of it. But if it's an element, this loop might very well 
execute. For all other types, this loop never executes. It's check, it iterates over an empty set because elements are the only types of nodes that can have what? Attributes. So this is meaningless for all other node types. It's not invalid because remember even project one, everything's well defined, just some things are null. They have no meaning even though they are syntactically fine. So this does kick in if the current node happens to be an element which further has attributes, in which case in the middle of the copy, notice that it's open here and not closed till here, during the copying process, I'm also going to spit out these additional elements that were once attributes. And the effect ultimately, if I run this on my Blockbuster, is identical. Where, where does the actual printing take place, though? So there's no printing per se, and I should clarify this. Even though we as humans are indeed seeing things print to the screen, what's being outputted is a document, is a tree. For human sake, it's serialized and it's printed as a flat file. So where, in that sense, if we're, if we're comfortable calling it, thinking of it as printing now, it happens the moment the copy element closes. It gets dumped to the output stream. But what it's really creating a copy of is a node. It just, stylus is nicely outputting it as a flat file by calling its own built-in serializer. Yeah? Yes, exactly. And notice, though, I'm calling apply templates, though, on children. If I called apply templates on attributes, I'd get in trouble, right? Because then I'd be copying the out attributes also to the output document, but I don't want to do that, right? I'm handling them up here. Um, when I'm recursing, I'm only calling it on children. And again, by definition, the only thing that can be a child is another element, comment, PI, and such, not an attribute. That's on a different axis altogether. So it's quite cool. And again, spend some time after tonight if you're a little uncomfortable with this stuff, mentally working from version 1 to 2 to 3. Because if you can get to a point, say, within the next week of being really comfortable with where the, why this works and why version 2 worked and why version 1 worked, I think you'll be in a really good place when it comes to tackling not only our courses projects, but really anything in XSLT. So a couple of notes on just other things that are useful to bear in mind. But do take a moment, if you're curious, at any online reference that explains the distinction between copy and copy of. The distinction is one of shallow copy versus deep copy, uh, nested copies and such, recursive, if you will. Um, we've just seen the example of outputting nodes. Attribute value templates. Here's an example. And you'll see these more commonly in examples as we proceed. But just to give it a little more context, if this is a fragment of XSL, and I have a template that matches a photograph element, and the purpose of this template is just to output an image tag with a path and a width and such, attribute value templates just save you keystrokes because you can just start typing the literal HTML, which is just XML, or rather XHTML is XML. And rather than get into the a nuisance of typing XSL value of, select, equal, such and such, you can just use curly braces if you want to put it inside of literal text. So the alternative, to be clear, is to use one of these constructs. right? The equivalent of that third line of code there, the image source, I could instead say XSL uh, element name equals IMG, then inside of that, XSL attribute name equals source select equals, I mean, already this is getting really, really tedious. But that's the direction I'm going in, if that's sufficient. Attribute value templates allow you to avoid this very cumbersome syntax and just say what you mean. And so in that sense, it's wonderfully useful, even though it's a bit of a, you know, it starts to push the limits of what's supposed to be XML syntax in the first place, but useful. Um, multiple source documents. So if you want in an XML, XSL file to access not only the XML document that your processor has applied the XSL file to, but you also want to read in another XML document, you can use the XPath document function, say document, quote unquote, where the quote is a relative file path, like foo.xsl or dot dot slash foo.xsl or so forth, XML. And what you get then 
inside the variable, which I just called dot, dot, dot here, is if you called the variable foo, and suppose that you read in a file called bar.xml, and the contents of bar.xml were bar slash bar and then some stuff. What you would get inside of dollar sign foo, if that's the name of the variable you chose, is a node set containing bar. So it just dumps the file into the variable as a node set with the root of the document being the node in that node set. And then everything hangs beneath it in tree form. Oops. Uh, recursion. So this was just a reminder that what we've been talking about tonight is recursion. Uh, that side can probably go. And here's the reference for uh, extension elements. If you're interested in pushing your own comfort zone and actually solving problems beyond the abilities of the built-in stuff with XSL and XPath, by all means pull up these references in particular because they show you the extension functions you get for free with Zaylin. Just realize, as this suggests, that extension functions are not universally supported. So you can't necessarily run code that assumes these are functions, say on Saxon, if you wrote them originally for Zaylin. But that perhaps is a, a reasonable price to pay. So next week, we'll finally tease apart the value of namespaces and just wrap a bit of um, a more of a formal understanding around them, because they're going to um, they're going to be present throughout the remainder of the course, even more so as we integrate more and more languages. And we'll look both at SVG and also XSLFO, the second of which SVG is this XML-based language to express shapes and lines and polygons and colors, the latter of which is like a type, almost like a typesetter's tool. It's a very, very expressive language, sort of similar in spirit to PostScript, that level of detail that's not terribly easy, I think, to pick up, but will give you enough of an exposure to it so that you can use it for projects 2 and 3 and or 4 to generate PDFs using Java and a uh, XSL engine. And so in that sense, it'll be useful. In fact, for project 4, you'll use it to generate PDFs that are receipts for items that users um, check out uh, buy products with and then receive upon checkout. So it certainly has its uses. And if you use it, the basics of it, you can make decent looking PDFs quite easily or other images for that matter. All right, so let's call it a day here and I'll stick around if you have questions. <laughs>